On this tape, we're going to start our canopy detailing. On the last tape, we fit the canopy. We had Dave Midgley molded up canopy. We had Dave Midgley molded up. And this one, we're going through our books, trying to pick up some good canopy detailing ideas. And we have plenty of plenty of pictures in our library, so we should be able to do a relatively nice job, I hope. And I hope there's going to be some good information on here that'll make your model a little more uh, sexy, attractive, whatever word you want to use, realistic. It's really all in the eye of the beholder anyway. And one of the defining features of a Spitfire canopy, and we haven't molded it before, I haven't made one before, is that the yoke, they call it a shovel handle yoke, as the machine gun firing mechanism. We're going to try to put that as part of the detailing for this model. And of course a nice dashboard full of gauges, a little simulated seat. The first part of any, any real cockpit detailing is get yourself a book. In this case you can see one of the things, the headrest, the shoulder straps, the radio behind the cockpit. Anyway, I want to get a little look at some of the ideas that I want to incorporate into this cockpit detailing. And a good way to do that is just to look at some of the models I've already made. A very strange... made the plug, added the glass, and did the fitting. On this tape we're going to try to do, or at least get started with, a real nice rendition of cockpit detailing. Okay, the last time we worked on this, and keep in mind we're doing a lot of things at once in the shop here, a lot of molding projects. I'm trying to segregate them out into meaningful videos. But one of the things that was extremely important before we start the canopy mold, the detailing, see I'm thinking mold, not detailing, is I want to make sure again, a final time, that I have the fit that I want around the radius, around the back, that it's lined up the way I want it. And once that's done, and it looks like we did accomplish that the last time we worked on this, we can put the plexiglass away and the next step of this is going to be to try to lay out exactly where we want to make the bulkhead for the back and we need to reference off the first thing and what I'll do is I'll work from the back to the front I need to reference where this bulkhead will be and what I'll do I'll use this piece as a just to rough it out make it a little oversized cut this piece and then I'll have this little section completely enclosed Now this will reference me for this part. Now a good way to do this is we know the groove is parallel. We can feel it with a piece of eighth inch tape. And I want to add a little piece of eighth inch tape just for my own, like a little safety margin. So I have a little bit of material extra. So I can always cut it back it's a lot easier to cut it back than to add material. And this will give me a little rough layout where I want this piece to end. Again, it's always easier to lay this out with tape before you actually commit to a cut. So 
See now with the tape on, what it allows me to do is move these lines, see if they're parallel, if they're crooked in any dimension, and I can just adjust these until I'm real happy before I make my cut. And I'll even leave a little extra material. Now because this is already covered with fiberglass, I want to use a brand new XL blade and get one real nice cut on this. I want to leave a little bit of a rib there, a little bit of a support. Keep in mind this whole fuselage is fiberglass, so you would think we'll have some integrity there anyway. Okay, now we've got a box to work in. What I need to do now, I need to measure this dimension forward to the bulkhead and this dimension across and make up the little plate that'll be the bottom plate for this, the back radio compartment. Now this is certainly one area where using a, an XL cutting pad and brand new blades will make for a lot nicer, neater operation. Well, in essence, this once this is trimmed, this is going to be the back radio compartment shelf. So that's tack glued in. I can trim the edges nice. One of those great little spots, a Bud McKnight sanding stick, a la nail file, seems to work. And once this edge is totally blended in now because this is an edge I'm going to see once the canopy is on here I want to harden it up with CA once I have the shape right and that will be a finished edge now one good way to do this to avoid making a mess is just put the good old-fashioned CA on a Q-tip It'll actually give a better tooth to the epoxy, too, when we epoxy the, ca the canopy on permanently. Now we have that edge finalized, I hope. Notice that word, hope. Once this kicks off, you know what I want to do? As I go, every step of the way is refit the canopy. Make sure we have the fit that we want, because if we don't, we don't want to put any detailing in there. Once those edges are all sanded in, you notice that they're hardened up with the thin CA. I want to make a bulkhead, a complete bulkhead for the back of this. This is acting as a fuselage former. That shell has no formers in it, and this will really make that back end of the fuselage hopefully nice and rigid. Remember that word, hopefully. <laughs> I make that piece out of 64th plywood, but I want the grain to be going side to side. So you can see one side of this is flexible. I want the strength in this dimension. So I'll lay it out with the grains going side to side. And there's a, a relatively easy way to make a good template on this. And just trace this from the back and sand the line off when I make the cut. And that gives me the back the back bulkhead shape. I can just take a look and make sure I have the fit I want. Okay, I got all these surfaces sealed up with two coats of thin Brodax CA. I'm trying to get a, a reasonably nice finish on them. The reason being I don't want to see the the wood grain in the final finish so it's easier right now to sand this than before I put the next bulkhead in. Obviously if that bulkhead is here it's hard to put a finish on this. 
So you want to kind of always think ahead. What can you pre-finish before it's installed? Now when I make this bulkhead that's going to actually seal this area up, I can only go down because of the push rod being here. Maybe uh, an inch, inch and a tenth maybe before I run into in interference. And then I have a, a piece that's an exact copy of this, so what I need to do is take this piece and add an inch to it. So what I'm trying to do is just do a little interpolation here. These are the, the rough angles. Best to make the piece a little bit oversized. And I know I can come down roughly an inch. But again, there'll be no substitute for just making it oversized and going back and forth a few times. And probably making up about 20 pieces before I'm done. After doing a trial fit on any of these kind of a parts, what I can do is, I've made a little notation. I need to add a little bit of material here and lower that notch just a little bit. So I'll just make up another piece. It's not a big deal to make these up, but I want to get a really nice fit on these. Remember, everything inside the cockpit you're going to see one way or another. This is how you can replicate parts making little adjustments. Now sometimes you get it in two or three shots. Sometimes you get it in 20, but either way, this actually acts as a bulkhead and a fuselage, so I don't want this to just be a part that goes along for the ride. I use the piece with nice straight grain. I want a nice tight fit around here, and I want to connect it with some rigidity to the carbon. because this, this is stiffening up this whole part of the fuselage. Spitfire actually has a pretty large canopy area. This is where it gets tricky is I want to make sure I have still have the clearance around here and that that piece falls into that the rib between the back window and the front part of the Malcolm hood okay now the next thing is to make sure I have a completely symmetrical I want to look at this from the front make sure it's symmetrical I don't have it tipped to one side or the other and now I want to line this the, from this part up to the top with a piece of 64th plywood. Now, of course, I want to trace this out. What I want to do is I want to know exactly where that glue is going to go. Then I, ne I need to do this by eye. I need to just kind of sketch this in. Because this will be one of the ribs. Now, if I'm in doubt, one of the things I can do is, again, I've always just want to do this to show this is an alternative way of laying out a part like this. When you want to lay out a part, you might want to lay out one layer of tape. What this will do is give you the same rough thickness. Whoops. Again, just knowing how to make some of these parts, I mean, I could remember many times looking at the scale RC stuff at the Nats and going how the heck does he do that look at Charlie Chambers P61 and go try to figure out that glass nose section and all those pilots and navigators and bombardiers and everything that are in there try to figure out how he did it but anyway this is just one example of a way that I can do now I can probably do here in this case just put a third layer in here and again this doesn't have to be super accurate but you can see it just gives you a little bit of an idea and every time you can figure out a way of doing things it's really the way of people approach doing things like a tile job when you see a tile I guess a tile mason a tile setter do a job how he lays out all the grout lines and everything you say oh boy that was easy but you got to realize he probably was doing it for 40 years. Anyway, these are just some of the tricks that I've seen, I've picked up from other people. Few I've invented along the way. Anyway, this is going to be one way. Now I'll cut that out, of course. Gives me a pretty close, you can see how off I was. 
when I was sketching it. If you're dealing with 64th plywood and you want to get nice edges, it's a good idea to cut this just a little bit away from the pencil line, pen line, either with a scissor or a new XL blade, and do the last little bit with a little grinder, a little Dremel tool of sorts. No matter how careful you are, you just never seem to get that edge perfect. Now it won't really matter because I'll grind that last little bit away. Again, that last little bit, always easier to get. And anytime you cut a part like this, leave the piece in place until you glue it. It's just an easier way, it's easier to handle. Well, this little tool, little whatever it is, VersaPak Wizard, Black & Decker Wizard. We use this every day in the shop now. Great little tool. this and you want to drill these holes the odds are good you'll just destroy the piece but a good way to do it is with a grindstone tip and I use the cable Dremel for this and just burn your way through by burning your way through go slow you get a reasonably nice edge actually burning its way through. A drill will not do that. A drill will just shatter the piece at the end of it. Now of course I want to test fit that I have that rib right in the center of that rib that's molded into the canopy. I get a little bit of an idea. I gotta move that back just a little bit. Although I see this is why you need this little groove cut. You need to be able to drop this canopy in at any given time and just get a perfect fit. This little thing is I put a little just a drop of CA on a Q-tip and try to harden up the edges of this so I can get a real nice edge. Once the CA kicks, I'll run that grindstone in there again and that'll really give me a finished edge and a finished look. And of course I'll run it from the back so it has a countersunk look. And I can also seal this area, which you'll see, so I don't have to do a double or triple finish and see the wood grain a hundred times either. And all this does is it keeps you from having to put on a hundred coats of finish to get rid of that wood grain. A lot of these parts are really hard to get at once you install them. And of course it makes it a little more rigid so you can get nice edges on it. The part we're not going to see I won't worry about. If you keep doing this you'll find out you get a really nice edge. And when you just touch that with that grindstone once it's painted, it'll really look, it'll have that look of, how did he do that? Well, if you ever, again, if you ever want to really see some quality scale work, Charlie Chambers P61 just had me, it had me breathless looking at it at the Nats. Once that has a couple of coats of thin CA, just a little hit with 600 sandpaper. And you've got almost a almost a part that's well you do have a part that's ready to paint and after one or two of these coats you get almost a little shine on the parts 
Man, this is one of those really, if you try to make this a piece in balsa wood, it's really difficult. This way you get the nice edges. I use an exactly the same techniques. And keep in mind, we're not making an exact scale copy of the cockpit. I'm looking for the flavor. And it really would be impossible to do a scale, totally scale cockpit as if this was a scale model. We want to get some of the flavor. And if you look in the back of a Spitfire, you see a lot of areas that have these lightning holes. So I'm trying to make this a, uh, well, it's kind of a fantasy cockpit. But again, if you get the flavor, and you do it with the minimum amount of really hard work. This is this is a relatively easy way to make this look aircraft. Has that look of lightened aluminum. To figure these little techniques out, it's only a matter of time before you can find all different ways to apply them. In this case, the thin CA harden up the edges. Another part of doing this kind of a cockpit is to create illusions. Now one of the illusions we want to create, of course we want to keep the main cockpit area sealed off from any of the dust or dirt or whatever that, that would eventually accumulate inside the fuselage of the plane. Remember the fuselage is open at the wingtip, it's open at several other places too. And what happens if you have a, very, a big gap somewhere in the cockpit, a big hole, all these little balls of chips and things wind up working their way into the plane, no matter how careful you are. So I try to seal as much as I can, and then just leave one little pinhole so moisture can get out. But what I want to do now, and it's a, it's a really excellent trick you can apply over and over again, is create an illusion that these holes go all the way through. And the way I'm going to do that is with a black ink marker. I'm going to blacken the inside of these holes, and then blacken the part where this goes on the fuselage so that when you look through it, it'll tend to look like, and I'll just paint the outside, it'll tend to look like these holes are going right through even though they're not. It's like an, it's an illusional thing. And if you can create illusions, well, one of the things is we won't have, well, we won't, hopefully we won't have a lot of balsa chips floating around inside the cockpit. And you've seen many, a, I've had plenty myself, planes that there was a big gap, a big hole going into the cockpit area. And sure as, you know, sure as you're living, what happens is you wind up with this a chunk of balsa wood or something floating up. It'll always stick to the pilot's nose. Anyway, making these little aircraft looking pieces with the lightning holes, I think it adds a lot to the cockpit and obviously not much weight at all. The 64th plywood adds nice edging and burning the holes gives you a nice crisp edge. Now this is just an ordinary Sharpie marker. And I'm working from the back. Again, we're trying to create illusions. You really can't make a totally scale cockpit because the arrow shaft always gets in the way and several other things. We can't really do the seat in scale. But this is one of the things you can do to create an illusion. Now one of the things I want to do here, I want to mark where this is. Remember, we're trying to create an illusion here. Up some slow drying epoxy with some black dye in it. Just put a very thin coating on there. I'll let that piece sit in there and dry. While it's drying, I'll make up some other details. Now, whenever you mix dye into epoxy, it's a good idea. Try not to add too much. You just need enough to darken it. And in this case, this will hopefully help create that illusion of depth that we want. And again, another tip here is anytime you think the epoxy's mixed, mix it another two minutes. It's always a good, good investment that you've got it well mixed, especially when you have dye in, because you can't see the color change. It's drying, we can go have a nice cup of coffee. Come back and then we'll start working on some more detailing.
tried, I never had, never have done this before, is I put a little bit of this on a Q-tip to try to get a nice flat look like you would get in a shadow. Since this is supposed to, like in theory, be open, just took a little bit of ink and on the end of a Q-tip. And again, I may want to paint that, but for right now, A real Spitfire, the seat is different, there's no bracing inside, but I don't want to take a chance on having that canopy get squeezed. But I try to capture that look anyway. Anyway, the next thing I want to do is make up the simulated radio and put the flooring, the decking in there. Now what happens in this book, it shows the early model Spitz had this really crude looking radio, and I don't really like the way that looks. Because the, the truth is most people wouldn't even know that that's a radio, they'd think it was a... Uh, you know, something which just was glued in there. And I looked from a couple different angles. You see all that, that aircraft stuff with the holes in it? That, I'm looking for the look here. I'm not looking for actual scale details. Again, this is what this looks like in the real prototype, and there is no floor. Well, I can't do that in this model. I need a floor to seal that area from dust and dirt. Anyway, by looking at the uh, several of these pictures here, I'm trying to come up with... And what I did, I, I thought about this while I was having coffee. What I'm going to do is make up the radio similar to the one that I had in the original Spitfire. That really caught everybody's eye. So that's what I'm going to try to do is make, this will be a simulation, but yet try to still keep the flavor. Now this is the color, the zinc chromate color that most closely matches the pictures of the interior parts of the Spitfire. So I'm going to use this. This, I just picked this up at a, uh, a while back on a little hobby shop. It's made for trains. Any place they sell HO trains, you can buy this. And it dries with a nice effect. And the only trouble with this paint, it's enamel. It's not lacquer, so you have to kind of be careful you don't mix and match. This gives a nice scale effect. Now, another choice we have is we could try to use the... Uh, Brodac open mix up these colors, but since this is inside the canopy, I don't think that's really going to be uh, one of our high priorities. Anyway, I've used this in the past, and it does dry up very nicely. See, now the reason I'm painting this ahead of time, keep in mind what the, what the deal is here that I'm trying to do. Anything that I'm going to seal in or put things in the way, you know, it's like, it's like you have to kind of think about the steps here. Once I put that radio and that front bulkhead in, this would be very difficult to paint. So it's good to kind of lay this out in your mind ahead of time. Once this dries up and I'm happy with it, then I can go right ahead. just one step at a time and this is what the videos are good for see like what I do now I've kind of looked in the last couple of days at some of the videos and try to remember the things that worked and there's always things that don't work and try to boil it down to where it's at least you have the best chance of getting it right the Strega video for the bubble canopy is pretty good and the Seafire one is pretty intense too so Anyway, starting to look like a cockpit. Once that gets in there, now one of the things that I like to do, again, to create illusions, is simply get different textures into that cockpit area. In this case, what I'm doing, or what I'm going to try to do, never say doing, always say trying to do is make a little, the flooring out of a dull, the 600 sandpaper, which would simulate a dull kind of a surface. And again, I'll make up a little pattern here. What I try to do is, again, is just get different textures, different surfaces when the sun reflects in there. It doesn't look like it's all one big piece of balsa wood or whatever. Now here's where having a model that's already built and having the videos on how you built it comes in handy. 
I like the way the little radio looked that I put in the, in the original Spitfire, and I liked it so much, in fact, I went back and I made kind of a replica of it, not exactly, of course, but what I want to do now from this is I want to cover this with some sheet aluminum, and I know that sounds like, uh, you know, like difficult, but just think, if you painted this, it'd be real difficult to get rid of the wood grain, and the aluminum really, really gives it a dimension that you wouldn't otherwise have. Now in this case, the stuff that I know worked last time, I have these surgical blades which you can buy in any any Rite Aid store. I want to see if I can get this off in one piece. And you really have to be careful, these are really sharp. But when you turn this package inside out, it has just, just the right shape of aluminum now. It's a really soft aluminum, so you can really put a burnish on it and everything. I want to get that blade out of there without destroying the package. And again, you know, we're not really trying to make some scale thing where the guy's going to come by and say, oh, the radio was different shape in the other plane. Well, what I want is something that when you look at it real, it, real quickly, it identifies that it is a radio. Well, see, this has the, the blade in there. But you don't want to cut yourself with one then. Anyway, just, you almost have to destroy one part of this to get a, I guess I will just sacrifice half of it to get at that real soft aluminum. Now I know the real scale model is they have tricks within tricks within tricks for this stuff, but if for our purposes this will do. And what I need to do is burnish this down. Just looking through my box of things, for, see here's some some blade covers for a surgical blade that have some little recesses in it. Again, I'm looking for more for ideas than anything else. Of some of these. These have smooth aluminum. This has a little texture. So I'm going to take a couple of these apart and just see what I can come up with for an idea. It's real. Of course, we won't want to eliminate good old aluminum foil either. They're trying a few different things. Actually, the, the aluminum foil is actually one of the nicest ones. When I put a little burnish on it with one of the... And this is something everybody would, in theory, have in their arsenal. One of the things I wanted to try was burnishing this over sandpaper to make it look rough, like a typewriter finish would look. You gotta just see what appeals to you. First thing I did was just CA that down. As soon as that kicks off, I'm gonna trim this and wrap it like a little package. I guess it can wrap one side at a time. Again, I don't want to have any kicker at all in here because I don't want this to swell up. I want to keep a relatively, well, relatively smooth surface. It's like wrapping a Christmas present. Amazing. Now I've been trying to figure out some little riveting. Again, I'm copying off the original Spitfire. Trying to make a simulated look of a simulated radio. Now, once you have the, the little pinhead sets, you can use a have an ice pick where you can make one out of a piece of wire. Now you can see what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to simulate some little air vents. Anyway, this is 
basically a copy of, well, close to what's a copy in a Spitfire. Now, after I did work on this, I really wasn't happy with the way it came out. And it doesn't fit exactly the way I had in mind. It's still a little bit, well, and because it's so easy to make these, I'm just going to make up another one. I'm not going to try to make any corrections to it. And this is, this is, I guess, one of the best lessons to learn of all is if you're not happy with one of the parts, there's no point in being married to it. Just make a new one. Now, I know this is roughly the size, so this will be relatively easy to just replicate it. Okay, so now we have stereo. We have we have the only Spitfire in World War II with stereo. But anyway, I like this one a little bit better for now. We're at the end of the session, and I'll pick up this tomorrow with some more detailing. Now, I was really glad yesterday when I got done with this first little radio, simulated radio. I, I just looked at it and I just wasn't happy. And I just want to repeat because I know I know I've fallen for this trick many times is I glue it in, I think, ah, done with that. Well, like building a house, you gotta get, you gotta be happy with each part you put, especially in a cockpit, because when you're done, you, once you seal it up, you can never go back in and get it out unless you have a sliding canopy. Anyway, this was worth the wait. Now, if you don't have one of these, these are real inexpensive. You can even buy the cheapest one. They really come in handy when it comes to detailing. And what I want to do, I want to do some detailing on this radio. I tried both mediums. I tried using the uh, Sharpie marker. I didn't like the way that looked. And I had the thin touch-up paint that I've been using on the plane. It seemed to give me the effect that I wanted on that radio top. Use the other one for a practice piece anyway. You know, when you're happy with what you have, you can use it on the real piece. All right, next thing I want to do is make up the antenna simulated antenna. First thing I want to do is take some this is a 025 wire and polish it up because once I bend it of course I won't be able to polish it very much. Bend it around a drill of whatever diameter you want to start with. I <laughs> unashamedly save every piece of junk looks like it might be usable somewhere in a cockpit. I need to go through here. I need to find you have all these different diameters. Here's something I can use. Look for some anything that might be usable. Any little scraps. It's always good to have this I guess you could call it a junk drawer for lack of a better word. Pretty embarrassing. Anything here. Okay, now we have our little antenna bent. I want to slice, slice off a little piece of this thin aluminum tubing. Now see, this piece here, I want it to roughen up with a parting wheel before I glue it in because I don't want this to loose, obviously loosen up in time. This will give the glue a little bit better of a grip. I can burnish this just a little bit and it picks up the high spots in those little vents. Okay, we can kind of kind of be some somewhat happy with that anyway. thing is I want to get this material out of here so I can start making up the, the interior of the cockpit. Now the next step is I want to lay out the sides that align the sides here before I attach anything permanently. I want all these pieces just to drop in, a drop fit. And I can do that while the epoxy is dry and holding that radio in. further is paint the back of this so that I the part that you're gonna see paint it the zinc chromate color 
This way, once it's it can be drying while I'm working on these front pieces. Made up a floor pattern, and what I want to do is I put some contact cement on the back of it. As soon as it's sticky, I want to attach some 600 paper so that that'll be the floor. It'll look like a, an anti-grip panel for the floor. Biggest problem with putting a floor in, I don't want any interference with the with the arrow shaft. I'm just waiting for that to glue to kick off and then I'm going to make up the sides. Now I want to double check again that I haven't changed anything here and everything just fits right in. Now what I did, I cut two little dovetail joints in there so I can get a little bit better grip on the epoxy when this goes in here. I want it to be a really nice press fit. And one of the things that I really, you know, I've had planes where the pilots come loose and the pilot's head is falling off and whatever. So as I go about this, I try to make sure everything is as solid as, as can be reasonably. I mean, I want to be able to pick the plane up by the antenna, that kind of thing. Now before I glue this in, I want to make sure when I drop the canopy on, I have the alignment that I really want. Here's one of those areas... I want to have a little bit of black dye in the epoxy in case any of it oozes out. I don't have to uh, look at a big glob anyway. And again, this really helps in establishing get a little time. Instead of CA, you can just have some work time here is good. There's no substitute for when you're doing this kind of work, just having a little toothpick, a little bit of dye in the epoxy, it just seems like you get those real nice joints. Again, on the bottom I need to get a joint. Now while the epoxy is drying, I'm going to fit on the canopy to make sure I haven't... Seems like I fit that a thousand times, but if it's wrong, it's really going to look lousy. Okay, I'll just wait for the epoxy to dry. Now the sides... All I need to do is I press a piece of wood down that's oversized and I can actually, I probably could trace this right on here with a knife. And I can make up the sides independently. I'll make each side separately, put whatever detailing I want to on it and the last thing will be to get the, the dashboard pattern made. Now I have a pattern for the side. So first thing I want to do is I want to mark which is the inside, which is the outside. This will be the outside. Yeah, it'd be nice if I had a pen that would write. Because I don't want to get these interchanged. Now with this, I want to look in the books for some little details, but I want to make some little Inside the cockpit there's usually some ribs. This is scrap wood I'm just using up. This has got a bad piece of grain in it, so... You can make up some various little twigs. Various dimensions. And this will give me a lot of choices then. Try to make it as scale as possible. Now what I can do is open this up a bit. 
and I'll have some various thicknesses that I can work with. See how quick it becomes three-dimensional? All throughout the inside of the cockpit, you see these little triangles, reinforcing triangles. So I wanted to try to simulate some of them, along with the bracing that normally would go inside. The two things that predominate the inside of a cockpit are the little triangle braces and the lightning holes in the aluminum. Okay, next thing I want to do is make up a simulated trim wheel right for right for around here. I've left a little spot for it. Now that's just a little idea of what it looks like. I'm going to cut this out of balsa wood. A good way to just cut some of these detail parts out, sharpen up a brass tube, go over the XL plate, pad, whatever you want to call it. Actually, I want to go all the way through and let it stick into the... Now, the trick here is just glue one on each side of it, make like a little sandwich. The 64th plywood in the middle to start with. Okay, now I want to cut the plywood away and then sand that all down. Now it just takes just a little bit of time and patience to get this sanded down, but what we have now is the groove, the slot in the middle for the lever arm. a little hamburger <laughs> and you can harden this whole thing up with thin CA so that you have a little surface to work with but you have that little slot for the lever arm now and you know, then we can just position this on there and the only thing left to do here is dremel off this extra this is what would stick up outside the cockpit I can't put the arm on until I get all the little detailing done, but one side, I'll trim this off, paint it, let the paint dry, and while it's drying, I'll make up the other side. Pretty much the same thing. Now, of course, the more parts you can paint before you install them, imagine trying to do this through the cockpit and having all kind of things in the way. So part of what I hope you pick up off the video is maybe some sequence of events this paint tends to dry nice and flat, so I'm just making sure I get all, all the areas that I'm not going to be able to get to conveniently. But also, when this goes in, this will give a nice even paint line against the bottom of the floor. That otherwise would be, imagine trying to get that, that line real nice. Okay, now for the other side, I need a big trim wheel. Now on the left side, I want to have this simulated, this trim wheel. What I did, I just basically cut it and sanded it out of eighth inch plywood. And that's about all I'm going to get done today. But we did get the sides done. Some of the detailing done. I have the trim wheel. Just took a parting wheel and cut all those little grooves in it. So we got our work cut out for us tomorrow. Uh, I want to do the riveting work and tomorrow we'll probably get to start the dashboard. Okay, it's a new day and we're ready to try to get another step of this cockpit detailing done. Now today we can just check out the finish on these and that looks pretty good even with only one coat of that model railroading paint. The little pinwheel dried up nice, the little trim wheel. The other side, and that's ready for the lever. So obviously the first step here is to see that all these parts fit in and I don't have to make any little changes on them. But before I want to do that, I want to do a little ink line detailing along the walls and around here just to get a look at how this is going to look. Because once this, see the whole idea of all this, 
Once this is in place, can you imagine trying to get in there with an ink pen? Almost impossible. So the more detailing you can do on parts before you install them, wow, you're just ahead of the game. Now every year when I haven't done any ink line work for a year, I dig out my ink pens and they are usually, <laughs> they're usually filthy is what it is. But I always, the ones that have black ink, I leave with a black piece of tape. In this case, I want to have a, a medium size line. Let's just hope, hope within hope that, oh look at this, it, it's so stuck together. See that up, that's a fine tip. Years ago what I did a couple times, maybe I ought to do it this year again, is I sent these pens out to Bob Martens and he cleaned them. So expensive to buy these now. Set like this, years ago they were cheap, here they go. You can bet your life this is going to need a little work. By the way, any ink lining you do, if you look at the, at the ink type, it's black India ink and of course there's white India ink. It also, they make it for paper or for film. You want the ink, found it, I found it to work a little better, the ink that you use for film. Also, if the ink isn't sticking, in this, in this case I gotta clean the pen. If it isn't doing what you want it to do, rubbing the surface with some talcum powder, and that's a trick I got from Frank McMillan and it does work pretty well. Before you go doing any inking, you can just wipe the surface with that. In the meantime, I'm gonna take this pen apart, and these do come apart pretty easy. But next time you see me, my hands will be all black full of ink. See, a lot of times they're just out of ink. Half of the job of doing a nice ink job is getting a pen to work. Of course, if you're just, see there's no ink in there. That's, that's downright empty. The question is always, and I, I've tried it myself a million times, it's, here's where it's gonna get messy. Come on, baby. Anyway, the, the trick is, a lot of people have found alternative pens that work, but I still think in my case, and I've tried about 500 different pens, for this kind of work, the best pen in the world, and then now you have to shake it and try to hope, hope that it isn't all clogged up from last year's ink. Now this is gonna have to be cleaned. Hey, but don't, don't panic. In this case, I'll run this tip under hot water Now keep in mind, one of the things, and I don't claim to be a draftsman or even, not even a trainee draftsman, these pens are the biggest pain in the neck, look at the stuff coming out of them. But you know what, I can't complain because I don't do the maintenance, and the people like, well, Bob Martens that are professional draftsmen and deal with this all the time, they know all the tricks, see? The problem is there's no video on how to do this, I haven't found one anyway, if I could find out. What I did one time, I stored the pens. I just took the tips out and put them in Windex. That didn't work. Next year they were the same as if I didn't do it. So all I do is I try to keep them filled with ink and that's probably the wrong thing to do. Anyway, I'm sure after Bob Martin sees this video, he's gonna be sick. Anyway, usually if you do this for five minutes, you'll get the pen to work. Look at this, it looks like we've cheated death again. See, as crude as that may be to clean pens that way, that boiling hot water seems to work. Whatever clogs up in pens, that's a tip you can put in the bank. White ink tends to clog up a lot more than black ink, so always good to do your black ink first. This way you get in the mode. Okay, once I've done that much, now I'm ready to start some detailing. Hey, you might be thinking a lot of this stuff is overkill, and well, you're probably right. The reason I used a little ruler is it has some pretty decent spacing for where I want to have. And I've looked at the, the books that showed a riveting detail. And it looks like this will be a close simulation of it. I've tried other pens. This always seems to be the best. And again, I often wonder, you know, once a plane is finished and you skimp on cockpit detail, wouldn't it be nice if that first rainy day of spring you could have gone back and put one extra day into the cockpit? Now in my case, I put about two weeks into this. But I look at it for the next 10 years, or oh, hopefully a longer than that even. And once you pick up a little technique how to do this, obviously you can improvise on all kinds of detailing. 
I guess we're lucky we even got the white ink to flow today. Anyway, a little bit of detailing like this, I think it really dresses it up. Now with the two sides installed, that gives us a little more interest in there. And again, I'm going to let all the glue make sure it's good and dry before I go on to the next step. It's a good idea too to get a little box at this point in time. See if we can get the light to focus in on here a little different. Now first thing I want to do, I want to dress these edges off. Get this dressed off. The next step will be to make up the template for the dashboard and the seat. Both of those two pieces and that'll kind of round out and we can get a good look at where we want to do more detailing on this. We're allowing about two weeks for this total time to keep us on schedule. Really good, a good idea. Now I haven't put the wheel on yet because I don't know exactly where it's going to go. But to get a little box and keep all your little trim pieces because we're going to make handles and levers and lights and switches and everything. Keep them all in a box while you're working on it. Just makes it handy. The time you work on this, it just gets a little bit more interesting and a little bit more exciting to, uh, you know, to see it starting to round out and take place. And what we've been doing, we've been trying to work on this every day for uh, a couple of hours. We've got a pretty good time window that we're, we're working and trying to do all our molding work and helping other people get ready for VSC and the Nats. But we do get, we definitely get w at least one session every day in on this. What I try to do here is make a, just a rough balsa pattern for the shape of the dashboard. Now in a real model, it's, it, it's more horizontal, vertical, it's straight up and down. And I, I like to angle it back always, so you can see the reflection of the glass off the instruments. And again, this is not a real prototypical. We're not going to get scored on, uh, you know, what the uh, the instruments look like. But but when the the dashboard is angled just slightly, all the all the little detailing really looks just jumps out at you. And as you walk around the model, the light will catch a different piece of the, the glass or the jewels that are in there, or the switches. Everything seems to sparkle just a little nicer. So. Having, with that little piece in mind, now I can start to lay out what I want my dashboard to look like. Now the next step in this is I want to have the dashboard stick up just a little bit. But because I made a straight cut around, I need to make this an angle cut now. And I can trace this with a pen line and obviously it'll have a little bit of a curve to it when it picks up that angle. And by running a pen right across there, it can, you get a pretty good shot on the first cut. Now I can see these little angles. Let me just do a little dry fit here. So I want to make a new pattern up, picking this up and connecting this piece of the dashboard so I can come out maybe eighth of an inch and then that'll give me a little place up here for my rocker switches. Now what I can do from this little original pattern, again these, these are just patterns that I'm making. I know the bottom piece is okay and I know up to here everything is going to stay the same and I know this angle is going to stay the same. So now I want to come out here roughly, well, make it a little bit bigger than it has to be. And just interpolate this curve in here for now. Now, of course, I have to make sure I'm not interfering with that windshield fit. Now, this is officially P1, the pattern. First pattern we'll have for the dashboard of the plane. You know that's set nice and tight and from this angle here which to me is one of the critical things I have a little room out here to do some rocker switches or some some something with this. 
Again, by having that little angle, I really pick up, notice I just want to feel by hand, and I, what I want to do is put the glass over that and make sure I'm not getting any interference, because I want to be able to look right in the window of the, the Spitfire and see the instruments. Even from this angle, I just want to see that where I can see the reflection of the glass. With the glass on, it's picking angles up just the way I think it should. That'll just work well. I'm going to start with P1, which is my pattern. And the first thing I want to do is I want to go get the book, try to find what I think will be a reasonable instrument layout, and get a look at just just what some of the choices are in instrument layouts. Again, we can't make it really scale, but we can get that look of what it would tentatively look like. Now this picture here kind of gives you a rough idea of... Now see, again, real Spitfire. The dashboard is vertical and it's much further forward in the plane, so well, we're obviously not going to do it. And if you did this, when you in a stunt model, you wouldn't even see the dashboard. So. Again, we have to little, improvise a little. Here's a little drawing, and we did this yesterday. We made this wheel up. But just, you can see some of the cables that run inside, the lightning holes, some of the things we're trying to get a, a simulation on. Now, it looks like, and we haven't made this little lever yet, it looks like this dashboard is just kind of a rounded thing. I'm trying to lay out. And because this is an early model one, the instrumentation is totally different than the late model ones. Now, this gives you a real good look at one row of instruments, the master switch, second row, it looks like they probably in the early ones had three, maybe four rows of instruments. If we were a scale model, this would be real handy, but uh, in fact in our case it's not going to do much good at all. Anyway, I can just basically get the idea of the rows of the instruments. Some of the most important, when I go to make the yoke up, I want to make that shovel handle yoke, but just a little look at this, just make it as prototypical as possible. What I've done over the years is I save all this junk, anything that would normally go inside a cockpit in an envelope. And what you can do, a couple little tricks you can do, you can go buy a set of these instruments. And they are prototypical, by the way. Scale instruments. Okay. And what you can do is go to a copying service or a copying place and they basically will be able to shrink them down in one or two percent increments. See how you can shrink them down? Now you can see how the, the different sizes. You can scale them up. Look, you can scale them so big you, you only need two to fill the whole cockpit. But you really want to have when you buy a set of these instruments, obviously one of the things you want to do is be able to have choices. That word choices is so big. And here we don't know what scale we're going to want, but once we drill the holes in a panel, we'll be able to pick instruments of any scale. And, I, and another thing is that they like for a quarter a copy or a nickel a copy or something. You can basically, oh look I've even got little tiny ones. You can make a lifetime supply, put them in an envelope. And you never have to go through this again, whether you want big ones, little ones, tiny ones. Just a great way to have a lifetime supply for almost no money at all. You know, when you buy it, they give you all kind of details for doing these scale instrumentation. If you're doing a scale model, different things you can do. There's all kind of things available. But I found, I have my own little way of making a dashboard up and it seems to work pretty well for me best way I've found to get nice round holes in any kind of balsa wood is with a grindstone and burn them in. Whenever I try to drill them, it's almost totally hopeless to drill them. Burning them in always seems to work the best. Again, these little portable battery powered, these guys are just so handy to have. I can't believe I didn't have these for the last couple of years. can burn these holes right in. The thing to do is Take a little piece of scrap also before you actually use your real part. Go slow, just practice a couple of burn holes. And you'll see you can vary the size. And obviously halfway through you need to go to the back. And it really does leave a nice hole. 
Now I don't know how else you could drill holes that size, but this is a little tip I find real useful. Now if you're in doubt, of course another thing you can do is make two or three of these dashboards from the original pattern and lay out the instruments in different ways until you're happy with the layout. I wasn't real happy the way the first one was coming out, so I just just make another one up. And what I did, I took a little piece of sandpaper, mask and taped it to a toothpick, and so I can just add layers to this or take layers away. As well as having a little grindstone tip, I can get in here, clean the inside edge of this up, and of course this isn't the final cleaning. Right now it's it's just cosmetic more than anything else. The next thing I want to do is I want to glue a piece of wet and dry sandpaper to this and that'll make the surface of the dashboard. The closest thing we have to an anti-glare finish and you'll notice all sandpaper is not the same color. It's not even close in fact. So if you just if you choose you want to use gray or some other color, it's very easy, just change the color of the sandpaper. So what I'm going to do is mix up some five minute epoxy and get this laid right on there. Let it dry and then I can come back through with the little burr, the little grindstone and recut the holes. What I'd ultimately like to achieve is a lot of different textures inside that cockpit area. And you would think, you know, just taking a paintbrush and painting everything flat black would be the answer. Well, if zinc chromate now, if, if you lay it out properly, you really can get you really can get an interest. Set that aside to dry now. Part of our composite part of the shop, doing composites, we always want to be able to heat epoxy. And what I've done is put a heat lamp, hang it from a variable cord, of course. And now what, what this will do, it'll thin the epoxy just a little bit, give me a little better bond, let it kick off even a little quicker than it normally would. I think I can get the rest of the glue off of this. And just by looking at the, the way the glue is drying, I really do want to get a nice glue joint on that. I'll babysit this for a couple of minutes. Now with the epoxy dry, I could just make a little dot in the middle of this so I know exactly where these holes are going to have to get burned back in. Now the second part is burn them through from the front to the back and it should give us some nice cuts. And the next step is to lay this out on a piece of 16th balsa and plot out the spots where my, well I could do it on 64th plywood, it would be I think a little better plot out the spots where the instruments will actually reside. And what I did, and I'm going over it over and over again, I'm just taking a black Sharpie marker to darken these in, get a couple layers, just so you don't see the end of the wood grain here. Now, 64th plywood usually has one side real nice and smooth, and I want to cross grain it 
so that the grain is going in the opposite direction because this actually winds up being when it's all done it winds up being a former actually it becomes one of the fuselage formers so now I need to just plot this out with a fine line pen the next step is to lay out the instruments and again I have that full selection and cut them all out with a scissor and plot them and lay them out and get them exactly where I want them just want to get a little feel for where these instruments go even though I can't do this just if any of them are real obvious when you go to line these up, it's always best if the instruments are a little smaller than they should be. See, uh, you get a little ring around it. What happens if the instrument is too big? It kind of blocks it out. I don't know which looks less realistic. You'd really like to have it perfect, but in this case we have one set that's too big. This is why you need all the sets. You can just fish around and find some that are just about the right size. Now, Mama's home. Supper's on. We're going to end it at this point. Ready to put the instruments on their backdrop and try to get another session in tomorrow. Okay, today we want to work on that dashboard some more. Try to get off all the details. Well, when you just walk down here and look at this from far away, it really does have a nice look. Some of the things I have in my little cockpit bag of stuff. These little rhinestones, which make for great little lights. These, of course, for making... Remember years ago, people just put 50 of these in, and then after a while, the knobs would fall off, and pretty soon... The cockpit looked more like a pin cushion. Don't know if I'm going to be able to use this, but this is cockpit combing, maybe for around the top of the dashboard. It's a good idea. There's another thing, is I have some pictures of it, and of course I have the real planes here, so it makes it even easier. Some of the dashboards and some of the details that were on some of the other models, so you can get a little idea. Some of the little the lighting, the gun sight, some of the switches. So we got a lot of little things to work on. And it's good that this gets spread out over a couple of days because the next thing I want to do is I want to lay out the instruments. I was in the middle of doing this the other day when a phone started ringing. And now it's just a question of I'll get out the books. One of the things I like to do, make sure the instruments are not upside down or on an angle or whatever. And if possible, if I can get some of them to actually be where the real instruments are. Keep in mind, it's not a scale model. so. This, the shape of the fuselage is different. It's it's just not possible to make a totally scale dashboard, but to get the look we're after, I think we'll get pretty close. Now, a good way to get these in position, just hold them with the tip of a, a new XL blade. And I mean the smallest drop of, in this case, Brodac CA, the slightest drop will hold these right in position. Oops, what I could do is get the extra off so I don't have a big glob there. And of course if it's wrong, I can just go over it with another instrument. Now one of the ways if you miss it, you can take a black pen and go around it. We're pretty much just going to go by and replace these instruments one by one now. One of the little improvements I found is this: the CA was kind of bleeding through on the instruments and making them a little fuzzy. So what I did, I took some carpenter's glue, obviously Elmer's glue, some kids glue, even probably rubber cement would be okay. And that worked a lot better. It also gives you a split second to adjust the instruments. So a little improvement as we're going along here in, uh, in Instrumentville. Anyway, this, from this point on, this starts to really pick up speed. Okay, so now the next step is <clears throat> have a sheet of this thin, like canopy material to represent the glass. And what I want to try to do now, I want to mix up some five minute epoxy and just glue this in spots. I don't want to get any glue near the instruments because if you squeeze it and it comes in together, boy, does it make a mess. 
And then while that's drying, I want to very carefully position this on top. And when I'm all done, and I'll cut it out, of course, but really to get it as accurate as possible, with what the epoxy gives me a little chance to do is do this and get it all lined up just perfectly. Now the idea of this whole thing is when it's all done, and you walk by the cockpit, you get that little flash of off the glass. That little flash. That's what I like about this. And then while, when it's dry, while it's drying, we can make up some of the other little detailing. Those old map pins. One of the things that makes it look a lot more realistic, if I get a piece of aluminum tubing here, and make this, if you look at a real plane, a lot of them have a throttle that works in and out like this. So you can simulate that with a little piece of the smallest size of aluminum tubing that they make. Now that looks a little bit better, but the, the final thing is I want to get another little piece of tubing to make the sleeve that would normally be the throttle going in and out. At least on the air coupe, that's how it was. The air coupe Spitfire. And it's just two pieces of telescoping tubing. And I'll make a couple of these up for the various little controls. There's also a lever for the uh, retractable gear. I can make that little lever up similar way with a pin and a little piece of aluminum tubing. You can take an ordinary T-pin here, just cut one side off and put a piece of tubing on one side. It makes a very nice simulated lever. Again, this is all good little things I can do while I dashboard. The epoxy is drying. By the time that's done, I'll have some of this detailing ready to go. Now you just need to take a parting wheel and put a little notch in a piece of tubing like this, and you got it. It's all set. And now you got another one of the little levers made. And that's where that little lever will reside, but I don't want to permanently epoxy him in there because I'm going to be working up here, so I'll just store him for later. Now I got some of this thin aluminum tubing. I want to see if, the, if it's even possible to replicate the bends in this yoke. It's almost like a shovel handle. You see, the problem with this is I can't really bend it that sharp. Maybe I got to make this out of wire. Well, let me practice with this. See, I made this nice big bend, but that's too big in diameter. <laughs> Enough tubing to keep K&S in business. Not happy. The tubing didn't bend. It kinked. Wasn't real happy with it. But so what I did, I took a bunch of scraps of 64th plywood. And I want to see if it's just possible. I remember when I made the carrier hook for the sea fire. Uh, it's just trying to get this shape here. It's a little more round. And we'll see if we can carve this out of a piece of plywood. This way the grain will be going in a lot of different directions. When in doubt, use 64th plywood. Let's see what that looks like. I'm trying to get the feel if I have the right shape here or not. Wait, if you ever want to see a, something that's delicate here, it's like I'm doing dental work or something. Anyway, even if this one doesn't work out, I, I have an idea how I can do this now. Laminates of 64th plywood with the grain going all different directions are real good for when you want to do a little tiny part like this. It is, it is very delicate work though. My eyes are so bad, I can hardly see this. Can't even hold it, let alone see it. But it's all these little details that ultimately, ultimately when you're done, you're looking at, wow. Now I'll admit to making 70s, but I probably made 12. Anyway, what I have to do now is get a little dowel of sandpaper and hand finish this round. This is on a yoke where this, in a real plane, swivels back and forth, so I have to somehow s simulate that joint either with paint or ink. Now it's probably a, that's the final the final one I'm almost done for the night after carving this 
Now see how this yoke, well, obviously it rotates here on a Anyway, I'm going to hand finish it. This is about all I'm going to have time for today. We're getting this took a long time to do. This took a lot, a lot longer than just putting a toothpick there. Now I got a couple of coats of thin CA on here. Let it kick off normally, and I'll put a final finish on this and try to get some more of the detailing on that yoke. Remember that little thing of sandpaper on a toothpick? This is just the perfect spot for it right now to do some of the final detailing. Usually you need two or three coats of thin CA sanded between coats to simulate this uh, the shape. And after bending all that wire and seeing what a pain that was, boy, this looks like the lesser of two evils ultimately. Leave it on that. That was a lot of carving and sanding. I want to get a couple coats of paint on this. That'll probably be all we're going to get done tonight, but that's about as close as simulation. Much, uh, well, much much closer to scale than a toothpick, say. Well, that's it for today. We got, what I've been doing is storing all my little levers and things here. This, this was a, this took a lot longer than I thought it would. Everything on this plane is taking longer than I thought it would. Anyway, we'll pick this up tomorrow. Hey, today I'm looking at the little yoke. It dried up real nice. This is ready for doing the ink work. And what I want to do is I want to lay out all my little details that I've been making. Last couple of days, just get a look at them. All these little throttles and everything, because I need to figure out exactly what I still want to do. Every time you start a new day, you almost have to hit the reset button a little bit. Look at some of this and figure out exactly what part of this I want to work on. Let me go look at that dashboard and see what's next. This is what I, I bought this at a little craft store. And these are little, I don't know if we're going to see these up on a macro lens, little jewels. And what I use these jewels for is on the sea fire. You can see right here and right here. They act like little lights. In fact, we have one up by the switches. So I think what I'm going to do today is I'm going to first I'm going to make up some switches. Look at some of the other cockpits just to get ideas from these. This one has jewels in it too. Those little details. I guess I'll work on this first so the epoxy can be dry and figure out where I want to have the lights. I need to drill a little hole, or leave a little impression, and then just put a drop of epoxy in there to drop these in place. Eh, there's a lot of different ways to drill holes here, but this is one way that just seems to be a, uh, a doable way, and I need to just, I don't want to make them any bigger than they have to be. Yeah, I like the I like the look of the glass reflecting and because I get these are up high, these will sparkle when the light shines through them. Now this this really gets to be a lot harder than you think it is. So I want to get one tiny drop, just a little bit of epoxy down in that hole. Now what I want to do, I want to take a toothpick, just just wet it just enough. Come on. I don't want to get I don't want to drop it in and then have to move it. I want to get it right on the first shot. If you can see, let's see if I can focus in on this. Because this is the only way I know of to get it. Yep. Sorry this is taking a minute, but this is one of the things that I know everybody just loves to see those little jewels. Extra ones I'll save in that envelope with all the dials and gauges and things that I have extra of. Okay, I put this 
one to throttle kind of on off things. Now that could be a throttle, it could be a primer. In a real airplane, the primer usually looks something similar to that. But anyway, again, we're going to be making a fantasy dashboard. We want to try to make it as realistic, but it doesn't have to be prototypical. One of the things I heard all kind of comments about was the switches. So I want to make them up. I'm going to make them up a similar way. I'll do real quick, go through it again for anybody that hasn't seen the Seafire videos. These little switches add a real nice touch to any model. Start with a bunch of old T-pins. Doesn't even matter if they're nice new ones. They can be old and junky. And what I want to do is take them over to the anvil and flatten one end off. So it's like a little bit of a spoon. What I do, and it's really, uh, well, just cut off any length of pen. It doesn't matter. Until you have, I want to still maintain a sharp edge so I can hold this with needle nose pliers. Just makes it a little bit easier. Let's get a focus on this. Next step is just to try to file it as even as you can. step is just get an old block of balsa wood and we don't need any any particular kind and I'm using a piece of that Teflon paper and I need to get some real tiny washers now you really have to position a switch at this point in time where you'd like it to be either down neutral or up and of course I try to leave a little just the right amount get it straightened out and I'll line up the whole slew of them here. You can see this up, up close. What that looks like. Okay, now I need to mix up a little epoxy, put some black dye in it, and put a coating of black epoxy on these guys. And just one drop of dye in here, and that should give us what we want. Now I just I put this epoxy on with a toothpick. And again, what I'm looking for is it leaves a nice if if we if you luck out, I guess. It leaves a nice shiny the kind of look that a real switch would have. Similar to a real switch anyway. The idea of the Teflon paper is just in case a little doesn't get by. I want to get some on there, but I don't want to have a big glob. And it's always a good idea to, if you make 10 of these or 12 or whatever, and then make a few extra and while you're all set up and fooling around this stuff. Then the next time you need them, you'll either have them or you'll remember to do them. Now usually when these dry up, and if you want to speed up the drying, you can always just hit them with a hairdryer, of course. Put them by a heating vent. Tricks is just, just while this few, last few minutes while the glue is still thin, hang it upside down so it tends to drip toward the end and it gives that the look of a real switch when it dries. I'm just gonna hold this here for a couple minutes. Now I'm just putting a just wanted to show when it's all dried up and I've pressed them in. Of course you can make some of the switches up, some down if you want to be cute. Just one extra drop of epoxy with dye in it. It really does make the switch look like, well, what a World War II switch looks like.
Now a good idea, a little tip, is when you press these in, don't press them in with the little black edges. Grab it with a needle nose pliers just in front of the washer and press it in. And then what I did is I put a little few drops of CA on the back, thin CA, just, just so obviously so they don't all fall apart. Now I'm starting with a just an ordinary T-pin here and what I want to do I want to cut up a little piece of 64th plywood I fill that in with thin CA because I want to make the little handle like we have on the emergency brake lever kind of a looking at the drawings that looks like it repeats itself over and over again now I want to fill in that little area in between with some thin balsa hardened up with CA and then carve that brake handle Now I don't want to. I don't want to admit how much time I put into. Like making a little control handle here. I made up about seven of these before I found one that I really like. And most of this stuff is just, just patience and just copying things that are either from pictures, books, library is a good source of books, videos. Now once we once I get a final finish on this, a final, I gotta sand this down. I'll get it sanded. I'm gonna mix up some epoxy with red dye in it. Because in a real in this the real Spitfire, this handle is red. And this way. The epoxy leaves a final finish in one coat, unlike paint, where you'd see the grain and you'd have to paint it over and over again. And it leaves a texture that looks an awful lot like the plastic. I guess the handles were made out of plastic, I'm assuming they were. Oh boy, if you only knew how long this took to do, my fingers feel like raw meat working on this. Anyway, it has the little look of the emergency brake pull lever. I'm going to mix up the red epoxy now and see if I can make this look even a little more realistic. Now I had to mix some red and yellow to get this color. I don't think this color is the right color. may have to paint this after I'm done, but this will certainly seal the wood grain. God, making up these little details, believe me, this takes a lot of, a lot of time. It was very time consuming. But when it's all done and you're looking at little cockpit, now the, the trick is now is to hit this with a hair dryer and that just thins it out and you get all the details back. All our little epoxy and knobs and switches and everything is drying. I only have about an hour left in this day, but I want to trace out. Now see, this is the piece I cut off of the nose. And it's already fiberglass that already has a nice bend in it. So what I want to try to do is lay out the shape of the seat and the bottom part of the seat and interconnect them. And use this as a, either a pattern or if it comes out real nice, we can use this actually as part of the seat. That is the shape of the real seat. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't rolled and tucked and pleated, you know what I mean? Oh, I just roughly roughed this out by getting the height Remember, in a real airplane, the seat would sit much lower in the plane, so you have to kind of fudge this. But this is kind of the shape, just roughly the shape, that you can see in all the books. And so if I just rough this out real quickly, and I can get a look at what this is going to look like. Now this is the curve I want to capture. I want to capture this, what you would call it. Now obviously the reason this is like this is so the pilot can look back more visibility. And the easiest way I know to make any any symmetrical shape, and again I'm doing this by eye, I'm not doing this any real specific shape, but what I want to do is I certainly want to make it symmetrical. 
Then I can take my whole template. This would give us the diameter for the headrest. You could pick some other diameter that you thought by roughing it out. Because once I unfold this, it should be, in theory anyway, it should somehow have that close anyway. That's an easy way of just roughing a part out. Now you could make as many of these as you want, and I've been making multiples of every part I've made so far. Usually throwing a few away, keeping a few. Now I can go over to the plane before I trace this out and see if this is the shape, if this is going to look like the shape that I want. At least I know it's symmetrical. Now with the little pattern in there, I can get a rough idea. And I just want it to touch at the top. That would be scale. And it's got to rest on the subflooring, of course. So that's close to being... And the pilot obviously would... I don't know why I'm worried about this. The pilot can't even see the handle for crying out loud. But anyway, it's always nice to try to make it as prototypical as possible. If we're real lucky, we'll get the bottom piece of the seat out of the same piece of wood, and it'll also have a similar curve in it. Now I can use the same pattern and just get a little bit of an idea. It's a lot easier to do it with a piece of paper. Now, of course, this will have a curve in it. Okay, so, wherever I have that little piece of wood that's left over, it's just going to make it. I didn't plan it this way, by the way. I know nobody will believe that, though. But If in doubt, when you're doing a little project like this, always make the parts a little bit oversized. You can always trim them down. Let's see what it'll be when this part gets connected. I've just lost half of the seat here. When this gets connected, I'm going to have to uh, obviously put this cur this curve in. I used the original part. It, it just wound up being too short, so I just took some thin wood to make this piece. Because what I want to do is I want to finish this seat and maybe get the paint on it tonight, so that tomorrow I can install these parts. That'll be the end of these. Now, what I wanted to do also, oops. I wanted to put a little triangular brace in here. That's pretty prototypical of warbirds of that era. And I want to put that little, the headrest piece up here. I want to lay this out. Piece of 60 foot plywood. I need to have a way of holding this while I put a coat of uh, that flat aircraft. I don't know what we'd call it, flat paint, but I'm not going to do it in the same color as the zinc chromate. I want to do it just a little, just one color different. That's why I bought three different shades of it. This way the seat will kind of stand out. It won't look like it's just another, it's the same thing. And we have these two colors. Who knows what this is? Interior green. Okay. Let's try interior green. Now that's probably all I'm going to have time for tonight, but at least I got this ready to dry. And I'll, do, I'll carve that little headpiece out and I can let the paint on that dry. And tomorrow I hopefully can assemble all this, get this whole cockpit put together. Been a lot, there's been a lot of time doing this. 
A lot of hours. Now I'll just final sand this out to as, I guess, as scale a shape as I can and get a coat of flat black on it. Now today the little seat dried up real nice and I just want to get a feeling for I want to put all of this together for a split second. Just get an idea that every, if, if everything is going to fit the way I expect it will. Never fits the way you expect it will. Now it's almost like right now we're arranging little dollhouse furniture type of things. Now see this color green is just a little bit different. There's that dashboard. And I can get a little a little look at. And this is what I do constantly is just do a little mock-up to see if everything kind of fits. Looks a little bit different than when we first started. It's starting to look like I, you know, like I had envisioned anyway. And our little brake lever, the epoxy dried. Doing this with dyed epoxy is really a nice way to get a nice finish on it. It's almost impossible to get nice finishes on these little parts. This is a good little tip though. That little lever in it, that kind of worked out the way I wanted to. One more little detail I want to make of it. One of the tricks is there's not, there's not much better material that I know of than 64th plywood when it's laminated and what I want to do is I want to make a little schematic of the shape that I want oversize and then I want to cut out four or five laminations cross the grain and that gives you a nice material to work in little details with it needs almost no pre-finishing usually works well right away most important thing when laminating up little scraps of plywood, you want the grain going again. I keep saying it over and over again. But now I have a piece that I can take over to the grindstone, the Dremel tool. I can cut, shape, file, and it's for all purposes pre-finished. Once I sand it down, it'll just need a coat of paint and it's ready to go. And these old Bud McKnight sanding sticks seem to make a handy way. I cut that groove in with a little parting wheel. And this, of course, is trying to simulate a little quadrant type of control you would find on a World War II plane. The thing I want to do is epoxy that little headrest on the seat. And I can start laying out just exactly how I want to get the seat mounted into the, the cockpit itself. And the reason I like to use drops of epoxy because once we seal this up, we can never go back in and get it out again. And epoxy seems to hold well to the paint. All that epoxy is drying, I can do a little ink detailing, do some riveting on the uh, the yoke and some of the other little parts. I'm going to start to do a line of riveting right around the edge here. Just try to get it a little more prototypical if I can. And really, you can just be detailing and rivet heading as long as you like, is whatever, whatever seems to work to make it look a little more realistic. Our little quadrant now, we're just waiting for the epoxy to dry. And I can make the knob that goes in the quadrant. The little quadrant worked out pretty nice. This is all done with stuff you normally would have in a normal shop. The only thing that it's, it's just time consuming doing this and having some little ideas on how to make some of these little parts, these little handles and switches. But I, just, I, think, I don't think it's out of anybody's skill range. Just some of the little patterns you can put in, obviously all white rivets, 
white rivets with a black dot in them. Black dot. I like to try to vary it as much as possible. I don't like to make it all exactly the same. It just looks too redundant that way. I think it looks more realistic in a real airplane is all different size rivets. They're not all the same. Okay, now the next step is I want to put a small drop of epoxy on the bottom of the seat and up on this bridge work that goes on the top so this is all interconnected. I even put in that little wheel with the little bit of epoxy I had left over. Before I actually epoxy this in, I want to put the little sun, I don't know what you call this, sun eyebrow on it. And of course the easiest way is tack it right in the middle and then work your way down. 64th plywood again. Now this is <clears throat> something I bought when I was doing the sea fire. It's like cockpit combing. I want to see if I can use this. This kind of fits right on. Obviously it needs to be glued on. I want to see how this is going to look once it's in the... Again, they make this. It's commercial stuff they make for... Found this in a shop that specializes in RC and helicopters. I guess you could make your own out of thin tubing, but it adds a nice finished look. You know, the next thing I need to make up a piece of 64th plywood edging for these both sides just to cover up this balsa joint and then I'll be ready to glue this in permanently. Okay, got these little 64th plywood edges just waiting for the glue to cure out and we'll be ready to install the dashboard permanently. Before I paint these, I wanted to get all of this detailing done because what will happen is this I'll be rubbing my hand on this while I'm painting. Cut the little notch out with a brand new XL blade for the yoke. Okay, now the last thing I want to do here in this session is I want to get the inside of the cockpit painted, the glass part. Again, I got that waiting to dry, and now what I want to do is get the inside. Remember, this is on the inside, but I want to leave the glue area all around the edge where it's going to get glued. So I got to kind of go back and forth and see where this is going to get glued. The idea is to get it so on when you look into the cockpit, anything that you would still see in these ribs and things, that it's painted on the inside. You wouldn't see the, the filler or the, the paint that goes on the outside. And I want to make sure I keep that edge that I'll see from the outside. It's easy just to do this by hand. Now I left just enough around the edge where I can catch the epoxy without catching paint. Now what I'm trying to do is line up that I've covered all the areas that I normally would see once this is glued in. I think overall we got a pretty good representation here. I'm looking around for other little details I might want to put in here. Now using this, I got about a half hour left in this session, using this little P 
piece, I guess this was the piece of the nose, I had a little piece left over. What I want to do is, I want to make the equivalent of a little cushion. Now the real Spitfires, it looked like they had unpadded seats, and then they just threw a cushion over the top of it. It's hard to tell. The two books are totally in conflict with each other. We can make something similar to like a little pad cushion. What I want to do, I want to put some like pleats, like the equivalent of rolled and pleated interiors, and then kind of compress the wood down to make a. Uh, again, what we're looking for here is always is texture. And in the pictures, the cushion or the whatever you want to call it from the. It looks like it's leather, so it'd probably be a, a brown or a, a dark color. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to like the way this looks. I'm trying to make it look like a little rolled and pleated cushion. I'm sure this is not exactly what they had in Spitfires, that's for sure. But this will be a good simulation of a cushion, I hope. By folding up the sandpaper, you can kind of get the edges round. It's the best cu seat cushion I've ever seen is the one in Ski Dombrowski's Lace Maker that has the rolls and pleats where the pilot sits stretched out. Just exactly how a real one would be. Now what I tried is I took a piece of tubing and tried to cut it back so I could draw this across the wood and see if it would make nice pleats, but it didn't do as well as I thought it would. It kind of roughs them in, but it doesn't really do it as well as it should. But the last little thing I wanted to try to see if I could simulate here no telling if I can or not. I got a little bit of time. I want to see if I can put in some aileron pedals. I'm working off the book to look at. These seem to have the linkage right on the floor. So obviously just making them up out of little pieces of balsa wood. Let's see how they look in the cockpit once they're installed by the seat. Trying to picture that. Now this was more time consuming than I really remember it being, putting all the riveting details on the inside of the canopy. And when you look through the glass, obviously you can look in and you'll see the zinc chromate. Again, just one little touch. Something you can easily do. It's not very difficult to do, but it certainly takes time. What I try to do with this is get the epoxy to sit right down at the bottom and then install this using the tip of the XL blade and just use another one to just hold it down and take it away. Because if you get it moving around, the epoxy oozes out the edge and then you see an unsightly edge on this. Okay, I think we're about ready to put the glass on. Obviously one of the things I'll want to do is clean it up. I'll make sure it's really clean before I get the epoxy mixed. Now what I'm going to do is use real slow drying epoxy. I really want to have plenty of time to work this. And I'm going to babysit it for an hour or so while I'm doing that. The trick is too, if I had this color green dye, I would put some dye in the epoxy, but I don't have that, so I'll just leave it clear. Fill that little ditch, drop the canopy on and pin it around and then babysit it while it's drying. Yeah, I'm real happy. Each time I do one of these, and this took just a little less than two weeks, I'm always, I don't know, I'm always totally, uh, I just, just one of the things I really enjoy about these models is the cockpit detailing. It's a good idea. This is real slow drying epoxy. It's cold in the shop, so it'll even take longer to set up. Just work it down into the little trough there with a toothpick. Give it plenty of time to set up. 
and you get one shot with the canopy to get it on straight. You take it up and move it, usually you smear the epoxy all over the place and it's a mess, but anyway, we'll give this our best shot. And I hope you've picked up some, well, some good ideas on doing a canopy from this tape. Doing this kind of a tape is really, it really makes yourself, it takes longer than you ever think it does, and when you're done you say, ah, it wasn't bad at all. Now, now that I'm here, when I go to look at the beginning of the tape, I'm going to say, ooh, I remember what that was like not having that canopy on there. Anyway, I fill up this little ditch, I get to drop it on once, and it's going to sit here overnight. Now the, the more pins I can put around it while the epoxy is drying, it pushes in little rivets of little uh, like nails around the edge. So I've got as many as I can around there. Gonna let that just sit for the next half an hour or so. 45 minutes once that epoxy hardens up and I can take the pins out. But it's getting near the end of the day and actually what I want to do just babysit this for a half hour come back and work on this tomorrow. Letting it dry overnight is a good investment. Now I let all the epoxy dry overnight and today what I'm going to do, I'm going to real carefully pull out the pins. At 3 o'clock I'll be featuring my group of the week. This week's group will be the Chantel. I'm looking for any spot here, any spot where this is leaking. I want to mix up a drop of five minute epoxy and fill a crack or back here if there's any spot. And boy, I just kept putting pins in and nailing that sucker. You can move the whole plane by the canopy. Because I know the reality is this, this really does take a beating in time. Anyway, the next step then would be once this, and I see there's a little air space here, there's a couple little spots where I want this to be sealed because once I start sanding it, I don't want any of the dust getting inside. And then I'll also have to mask off all the areas that will remain clear before I start sanding on this. I don't know how much of this we're going to do. We're kind of near the end of the tape, but we'll try to get get this roughly sanded in anyway today. Get some Brodac primer on it. And then pretty much we're going to be ready to finish the paintwork on the plane. And that's something I'm really looking forward to. We're only a month away from flying season and I want to get going on this. little things that you may think you don't even have to, it's not even a factor, is pulling the pins out. What I've seen a lot of guys do is they grab the pin with a pair of pliers and can take out a chunk of wood or distort the canopy. What I try to do, especially what's especially nice is these pins that John Pothier sent, they have a little like a handle on them or the T-pins where you can, and I just was using up old pins here so I have some of each, is twist the pin a little bit as you pull it out and kind of unscrew it. And the reason is, you don't put a strain on. That wood is kind of thin there. The canopy obviously is thin. Now what happens is, everywhere there was a pin, there's a little tiny hole. And what I'm going to do when I take the epoxy, I'm going to heat up some epoxy, and just put one little drop down in each one of the holes with a toothpick. And what that does, it acts like little rivets or little staples to even make it stronger. And even though that may seem <clears throat> it may seem like, yeah, wow, that's overkill. My canopy never fell off before. What happens is, what I'm looking for here is a plane that, like some of the planes we've been lucky enough to have 10, 15 years. I think we've got one 17 years old, two still flying. But as the planes get older and older, this is one of the areas that it'll start warping and you may, may be subject to having some bubbles or something. And I think just having that rigid there, it also, it's a, it's just one of the things that I'd like to maintain after all that work we did on the canopy. I just hate to see this side of the fuselage warp out or something crazy like that. This, this is now like a little focal point of the plane. And if, it's, if we're lucky enough, it'll last in the entire life of the plane without the seat coming loose or without who knows what. In, that, in, in model aviation, everything's a surprise, but that we don't have something that we normally wouldn't have to deal with there. I'm going to take the rest of these pins out and see if I can get these little holes filled in. And I, maybe I'll even try using a pin and just putting a drop of epoxy down in each hole. They can get a drop of epoxy right down in each one of those holes. 
That'll really make it solid. Again, I want to be able to pick the plane up by that canopy. Okay, now all the epoxy on the edges is dried. Next step, I'm going to mask off the windows very, very carefully so that as I'm sanding and grinding and priming, I don't get any scratches on the glass at all after all that work Midgley did on that. 